Welcome again. In this session, we're going to be reading Luke chapter 12, verses 49 through 53. Jesus causes division. Yes, that's the title of this whole teaching right now is Jesus causes division. You know, there's another, uh, there's a Bible that says uh, in, in one of the subtitles, it says not peace, but division. So let's read about this. This is uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 49, and I'm reading through to verse 53. These are the words in red, the words of our Lord himself. He said, I, ca- I came to throw fire on the earth. I wish it were already kindled. Hmm. I wish I came to burn the earth, <laughs> Okay. I wish it were already started. That fire has already started to burn. Now we read, now let me just uh, stop here for a second because, you know, we read in the scriptures about the days of Noah, okay? The days of Noah, it says that these people were very violent people, uh, immoral people. Now it says that um, God uh, was very, uh, pretty much sorry that he created uh you know, humanity. And it says that he sent a flood to destroy, you know, to destroy the whole land. And, um, you know, most of you know the story. And then afterwards, he sent, he set a rainbow to, pro- his, his, the rainbow was a promise that he would not destroy the earth again with water. Okay. But it says very clearly that just as God destroyed the earth with water, he will destroy it with fire, okay? So whenever you see the rainbow, think about, yes, God destroyed the earth because of their sin, but that side of the rainbow also says to us, he will destroy it with fire. According to the letter of Jude, that this is basically the, the half-brother of Jesus, and the, uh, the letter of Peter, Okay, Peter says, and Jude says, that Sodom and Gomorrah is just an example, just a little bit of a preview of what is to come, what is to come on the earth. That just as the world was destroyed with water, so it will be destroyed by fire. Okay, and again, they use Sodom and Gomorrah as examples. So Jesus said, I come to throw fire on the earth, but I wish, I wish it were already kindled. Verse 50, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, okay? What is he talking about? You know, again, if you read the scriptures, you'll understand, especially in the book of Colossians, it talks about the baptism into death. So Jesus says, I came to throw fire on the earth and I wish it were already kindled, but, okay, first, 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 there are some things that need to be done. First, I have to be killed you know, raised from the dead. And then sometime after that, the fire will come. You know, he didn't, he didn't specify, obviously, whether it was minutes, days, hours, months, years, millennium. Okay. Uh, but he said, verse 49, I, I, I came to throw fire on the earth. And this is what it says. It says, when Jesus does come back, the scriptures is very clear. When he comes back, he will destroy the ungodly with fire. Sodom and Gomorrah was just a little bit of a teeny tiny preview trailer of what's coming on the whole earth. And he says, I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. That means he has to die. Baptized into death. Baptism, uh, the literal meaning of baptism uh, means to be immersed, okay? To be dunked, immersed, uh, to be covered, Uh for, for example, I, I heard that an old uh, ancient Greek recipe for making pickles is that you're supposed to take the cucumbers and baptizo the, the cucumbers into the brine solution. Okay, so the baptizo is the Greek word that we get baptized from. So when you take cucumbers and baptize them into the brine solution, that is actually baptizing the cucumbers into the brine. 
Okay, so in the same way, Jesus said, I have to be baptized in death. Okay, and once again, if you were really born again, you are baptized in the, beth, the, the, the death of Jesus and, uh, and you're risen with him. And, and uh, if you're truly born again, you will see a huge difference in your life. You will be able to say, hey, this is where I was born again. This is the old sinful self back here. Now I live in righteousness according to God's will and ways and laws by the resurrection and power of Jesus Christ. So, uh, yeah. So Jesus said, I come for fire. But, first of all, <laughs> uh, I have to be baptized. Uh, with. There's a baptism that I'm yet to be baptized with. Now, we know that he was baptized in the days of John the Baptist. Now, this is after that. Of course, he's not talking about that baptism. He's not talking about, he's not talking about the baptism in water, but he's talking about the baptism in to death. How distressed I am until it is, it is accomplished. Well, yeah, obviously, like anybody who knows their death is approaching uh, Im imminently, then you will be distressed probably. Um, so verse 51, do you think that I've come to bring peace on the earth? How many people today think that Jesus came to bring peace on the earth? Okay. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, you know, uh, you know, it says when he was born, you know, peace and goodwill toward men, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, okay. But in context, this is peace only when you fully submit to Jesus' will. You fully submit to him. When he said, be holy as I am holy, you need to be holy, man. Not burning in sinful lust or covetousness, or hatred, bitterness against people, slandering, gossiping, all kinds of stuff going on. You need to be holy. When Jesus said, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, he wasn't, he wasn't, <laughs> he meant what he said. He wasn't joking. Okay? And it is possible to be perfect as a heavenly father in heaven is perfect. That doesn't mean you're not going to stub your foot when you're, when you're walking. That doesn't mean you're not going to make a spelling mistake. But that means perfect according to the law of God. And I assure you, friend, it's not hard to obey. God himself said at the very end of the Torah, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, that it's easy to obey. You don't have to climb all the way up to some distant galaxy. You don't have to dig down into the core of the earth to get it. It's right there, right near you. It's at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. In your heart and in your mouth. This is easy to attain. Perfection, according to God, is easy to attain. God didn't say, thou shalt not make a spelling mistake. God didn't say, thou shalt not stutter. Stuttering or making a spelling mistake or just simply making a mistake that's not against God's law is not a sin in God's sight. Okay? So perfection in the eyes of men is completely different than perfection in the eyes of God. You got to look at it from God's point of view. And how do you know God's point of view? Read the scriptures. Jesus said, do you think that I've come to bring peace on the earth? Do you think that I, I've come to make everybody just hug and kiss everybody and bring, and bring peace, not war? He said, I tell you, no, but rather division. Jesus said clearly, I didn't come to bring peace, but I have come to divide. Verse 50, 52, from uh, for from now on, there will be five in one house divided. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Okay, that's, uh, that's found also in Micah chapter si uh, 7, verse 6. I'm just going to go over there to Micah chapter 7, verse 6 here for a second. Micah chapter 7, verse 6 says, For the son dishonors the father, the daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, the man's enemies are the men of his own house. Okay, so what did Jesus mean? What did Jesus mean when he said that he has come to bring division, that he's come to divide? How is it that he divide? He says, you know, be five in one household. That's a family. That's a mother and a father, children, you know, in-laws, 
How is it that he divides? Now, before I get into detail here, I, can, I have to tell you that I know of families that are secular families that do not really, they're not born again. They're not, they don't really believe in God. They don't really believe in Jesus. They don't really go by the Bible at all. And they're more in unity than some other families that, that have real, true Christians in them. Okay. Again, how is that? Why is that? Well, when you become born again, you're really born again. You, 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 you go from being a part of this world to not being a part of this world. You go from being a caterpillar to being a butterfly. You have metamorphosis happen to you. Okay? You are a completely different person. You are a completely different person. When you're truly born again, you can say, the old is all gone. As it says in the scriptures, The old man is gone. The old sinful self is gone. The old way of life is gone. You know, all of my, the the old lifestyle is completely done, dead, done away with. My sins are now dead because I've been baptized into Christ's death. And now that I'm risen or born again with Christ... Now I live in righteousness and truth. Now I, I guarantee you, if you come from a family who does not really know that, if they don't know what it's like to really be born again, when you when you get born again, you are different, way different than they are. You become completely different than they are. You're not listening to secular radio anymore. You're not listening to secular TV anymore. You're not listening to secular music anymore. You're not, li- you're not reading secular books anymore. You're not engaging them in gossip anymore. You're not, you're not uh, you know, conducive to, their sl- to slandering other people anymore. You're not living the lifestyle that they're living anymore. It says in the scriptures over and over again, come out from among them, says the Lord, and be separate, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. So that's how Jesus causes division. You have to come out from among them. What does that mean? That means come out from among your friends. Come out from among even your family. Perhaps you hold your sister so dearly. Perhaps you hold your brother so dearly or your parents so dearly. But if they're not walking in the ways of God, you need to come out from among them and be separate. And some people, they can't do that because they worship their family members more than they worship God. Isn't that true? You need to take this seriously. You know, uh, some people like uh, I've been reminded of a, of a verse that I've studied many, many years ago. You know, the grace of God. Some people think grace of God just covers sin. No, it says in Titus 2.11, the grace of God teaches you to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly. Soberly means taking this seriously. Not just thinking about it and walking away from it. Not just like like it says, like James says, when you when you hear the word of God you, and you don't do it, it's like looking in a mirror. You walk away and you forget what you look like. You don't want to be that stupid. But you need to do it. You need to do the word of God. You need to take it seriously. The grace of God makes you take God's word seriously. Makes you live for God seriously. And that means sacrifice. You have to sacrifice sacrifice some, if not all, of your friends. You have to sacrifice some, if not all, of your family. Some of you are not willing to do that. Well, you know what? If you're not willing to do that, you are not worthy of the kingdom of God. Jesus comes to cause division because he, ca- he calls you out from among them. As it says over and over in the scriptures, come out from among them. That's what being holy means, to be separated, set apart. Separate from them, whoever them is. Could be your friends, could be your family, or both. Okay? So it is very, very important to live holy, to live separately. And yes, will it cause division? Yes, it does. That's what holy is. That's what being holy is all about, causing division. Some people say, "Well, you have not. You know, who are you to say you you, you, know, you sin too? Who says? 
It says in the scriptures over and over again that there are people that don't sin. Je Zechariah says, uh, excuse me, John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. It says they walked in all of the commandments of the Lord blamelessly. Paul the apostle said in Philippians, I walk in the Torah, the law of God, blamelessly. He didn't say, well, you can't do it. There, you know, everybody sins. We, you know, the law of God is just to point to Jesus. Nonsense. That's nonsense. People who say that don't even think about what they're saying. God is not, uh, you know, a tyrant, uh, an abusive tyrant to bark out commands that you cannot obey. Okay? So, Jesus even said, time and time again, he said, sin no more. He said twice in the book of John to two different people, sin no more. He didn't say, well, well, you know, you're all human. And I know y'all sin. Just try your best. It's not what he said. He said, sin no more. If it was, if it's not possible to go and sin no more, why would Jesus say it? Again, is he an unreasonable, abusive master to, to command you to do something you can't do? No, it's not hard. The kingdom of God is near you. It is near you, within your grasp, you can do it. You can obey God. You can do it. So as you go, be encouraged. Be enlightened. May God enlighten the eyes of your understanding, give you great wisdom. And as you call upon him, according to the scripture, may he show you great and mighty things. Thanks again.